Fantastic. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence here, for what you want to say to us. Thank you that you're the God who speaks. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us today. You'd speak to us right into the very depth of our being. Thank you that deep calls to deep. And we pray that you'd, you'd speak deeply to us and in us. And Lord, that as a result of that, as a result of your word going into our, our beings, Lord, we'd be changed for the better. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Well, today is our vision day. And um, I'm really, really excited about what God is doing with our church at the moment. Um, so I just want to kind of rattle off a few stories of um, just this last week. Um, uh, in our staff meetings on Tuesdays, we go around and share stories about what God's been doing. So um, Gordon, there in the um, middle of the um, right-hand side, Gordon was telling us that um, Gordon's just started joining the staff of the church. He's um, our ops manager. And um, he was saying he had a dinner party. And they invited some friends around. And I think um, he was just saying, you know, I've got a new job. And he said, oh, I didn't know. What, what are you doing? I'm working for the church, he said. And they said, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. He said, yes, I am. And um, they, they said, wow, that's amazing. They had a conversation about that. And they said, oh, I'm really sorry for swearing. And <laughs> you know, it's amazing the impact that, that can have, just um, a change of job. And um, you, by the way, you don't need to join the, the staff of a church in order to evoke that kind of change in, in response. Um, I was hearing about uh, the mosque, the Daraluma Mosque, has a youth group. And they've invited a group from here to come and tell them about Jesus. And so it's amazing that Muslims wanting to find out more about who Jesus is. The night shelter got this email from Sarah Opie, who um, kind of coordinates the night shelter that runs on Monday nights here. She said this, after a few difficult weeks at night shelter in the last month, just wanted to let you know that we had a fantastic evening tonight. Two guys from Bethel Watford, which is a Christian drug and alcohol rehab community, came and one shared his testimony to all of the guests before dinner. He used to be involved in the IRA and an alcoholic and drug addict and now is a Christian and leading the house in Watford. It was incredible to hear what God has done in his life. And a number of the guests received prayer after dinner and there were some great conversations about God and the gospel. So on Wednesday, I was um, in, uh, speaking in Church House in Westminster. I was invited to um, tell your story, the story of St. Paul Shadwell, because we've been singled out um, with uh, seven other churches nationally um, to, uh, because of the work that St. Paul's is doing amongst the poor. Um, uh, it's being uh, kind of highlighted as an example of how um, churches can work in areas of urban deprivation and make a difference. And so you were kind of in the headlines of, um, of the General Synod, which was that, um, uh, what that was all about. We heard from our church plants, and they were saying that um, they're having a similar um, uh, uh, looking outwards in, in their churches as well as we are. And um, uh, Pam Hallower, who's the church warden at um, St. Peter's Bethnal Green, was just telling us a story how um, she's lived in that, uh, in that church community all her life, and lived in that community. And people are just beginning to say, gosh, something's going on in that church. And they're starting to have conversations with her. And she's saying, yes, God is on the move. And they're beginning to start asking her about Jesus and beginning to say, actually, we're interested in this as well. Another lady from that congregation called Michelle, who's 84, I think. Um, she uh, has, they've had a YWAM team, Youth with a Mission, as well as we did um, here, just staying with us over the last couple of months. They've been doing outreach in the community. They've been talking to people about Jesus. And this uh, lady, Michelle, said, I want to start OWAM, Oldies with a Mission, because she's been so fired up with a desire to tell others about Jesus that actually it's impacting her life and impacting the, the friends that she has as well. Um, in All Hallows, um, our other church plant, Chris is telling us that um, they have a Bangladeshi men's group that has been using the church for many years. And they've, uh, there were a couple of people who were not doing very well. They were depressed and um, uh, quite ill. And the group said uh, to these two men um, in their midst, he said, go, they said, go to Alpha at All Hallows because there you're going to encounter Jesus who's going to help you. And these Christians know how to help you. So go to this group, go to Alpha. So it's very interesting. God is on the move. God is doing stuff and he's growing his church. So that was just one staff meeting, which is very exciting. So we, we need to work out a way of maybe putting them on um, Facebook or Twitter or something like that so you, you can all get to hear about them because we get very, very excited about it. Today is our vision day. Today is where we 
are looking together at what God is calling us as a church to be and for us as a church to do um, here in East London. And I want to tell you the story. Those, um, we, I do this, I try and do it as much as possible because it's an exciting story. Seven years ago, in December, uh, this church had about 10 to 15 people in it. There's a church very close there, there and there, and um, they just thought, actually, we can't sustain this, and so they were going to close the church. The congregation said, no way, not on our dead bodies. So they went to the bishop and said, please, can you do something? And he went to um, Holy Trinity Brompton and said to the then vicar, Sandy Miller, would you send a team here and um, restart the church? And so um, in 2005, Louis and me and our family and 95 others, we were 100 altogether, came to reestablish uh, this church community. And we joined the 10 or 15 who are here already, and we started something new. We started this service um, seven years ago. And over the last seven years, God has grown this church. We um, have about 250 to 300 adults. We've got 80 children um, in the church. Um, we've had something like 700 adults through uh, as members over the last uh, seven years. And that's um, it's just because of the throughput of people, just um, London life, that um, many of those people have moved on. But it's been exciting to see God growing the numbers of people, but also he's been growing the influence of this church and the impact of this church on our neighborhood. There are lots of people um, in this area who will be able to say, yes, St. Paul Shadow, they do the night shelter, they run the food bank, they have a death advice center, they're the people who run Energize and um, who do um, the boys and girls clubs in the community. Lots of people know about this church. And um, just over the last seven years, I just want to mention three landmarks, just as uh, some of the things that have been going on. The first is that we, um, God has given us a missional emphasis. Um, about three or four years ago, we um, began to rethink the way our midweek groups, our connect groups work. They used to be called pastorates. And we said, no, we're going to be connect groups now, connecting with God and with one another, but also with our neighbor. We want to have an outward focus to the groups and an outward focus to the life from the church. We want to learn how to connect with our neighbors, how we can share the love of God with them, and how we can welcome them in, both to those connect groups and into the life of the church, this missional emphasis. Secondly, um, God has um, given us the opportunity to church plant. I talked about those two, St. Peter's Bethnal Green and All Hallows Bow. These were invitations from those churches for us to send a leader and a team to go and restart those churches. And it's been amazing to see the growth in those two churches. St. Peter's, I think, has more than doubled in size. All Hallows has gone from 7 to 70 or over in that church as well over the last year or so. So church planting is something that we're doing and we're going to continue to do. The third emphasis is um, what's behind uh, this, this uh, Invite 2012, which is that actually God has given us loads and loads of contacts in our community. But there was something which I was beginning to notice um, seven or eight months ago, which I was just beginning to think, actually, we don't know how to share our faith with all these people who we're connecting with. We have a desire to love them, but we don't know how to communicate the Christian faith to those people as well because of, um, well, lots of reasons. And we began to explore some of those, what those reasons were and how we could um, uh, press through and change that. And so that's what Invite 2012 is about. It's our own initiative where we believe God is calling us to learn how to speak about our faith to um, our friends and our neighbors, our colleagues, um, our families, and so on. And I think I have to say, you know, we're all learners. Um, not this kind of thing that uh, some, means something different, but a learner. Like we, it's like we're all wearing learner plates. We're all learning how to do this. We've, we're giving ourselves a whole year to learn how to do this. And it's been really, really exciting, even over the last two months, to see what God has been doing with us as we're taking those first steps of sharing our faith with those, those people around us. So our vision, our vision, the vision that God has given us is to see this place, Shadwell, and actually the wider area, East London, transformed by the love and power of Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can change the heart. Only he is able to work on the inside of a human being. And we have this vision of transformation, transformation of this area where God has put us in by his love and his power. 
what does that look like? It looks like people becoming Christians. People coming to faith. It looks like um, communities being changed for the better as we begin to, um, like uh, yeast in a batch of dough, begin to influence the, the, the wider area. It means actually the very structures of our neighborhoods changing and being transformed as we begin to um, pray for our schools, as we begin to pray for our council, as we begin to um, uh, play our part in seeing our society transformed. That's going to be a long-term vision. It's a 25-year vision, but it's a vision that God has given us. How does that happen? It's the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, who has the power to change our lives and change the lives of anyone who comes to him. Just have a look at this amazing passage of Scripture that um, we had read to us, 1 Corinthians 15. Because it is Paul's conviction, St. Paul who wrote this letter to the Corinthians, that the gospel should be something that impacts people's lives. And his intention in writing this letter is that it should be our um, intention too. It should be our conviction. The first thing he says is this. He says, be confident. Good verse one. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. You have responded to the good news. That's why you're here today. You've received him and you've made a public stand. And Paul is reminding the Corinthians as he reminds us today, be confident in that stand. Be confident in the gospel that you've received that is making a difference in your life. Why? Look at verse 2. By this gospel, you are saved. You know, our motivation for living differently, for um, living purposefully, is because we have been saved from the consequences of our sins. We've been saved from separation from God by what Jesus has done on the cross. He's enabled us to reconnect with God through his death on the cross. It's by his wounds, his death, that we have been healed. We have been restored to that relationship with God. I love the fact as well that it says you are saved. This is a present tense. This is something which is not something that happened a long time ago. It's not something that you were born into. Not something that maybe you made a decision when you were younger and that was that. You are saved. You are being saved right now. God is at work in you transforming your life. The gospel affects us today and every day. The gospel affects you when you go into your workplace, when you go into your home, when you go into your community. The gospel is at work in you. When we grasp that, we begin to actually um, uh, allow God to work in us right now. The things that we face, the situations that we find ourselves in, the, the decisions we have to make. God is at work and he wants us to assent to the things that he wants to do in our lives. He transforms, he heals, he guides, he strengthens, he encourages, he comforts. All these things God is at work doing. There's um, a man on our Alpha course at the moment. I was um, talking to him on Wednesday. And he said to me that he is um, an alcoholic. He has been an alcoholic for about 20 years of his life. And he's in a recovery um, unit at the moment. And he said, for seven months, I've been sober. And this is a Christian rehab place. And he just said, I couldn't have done it without Jesus. I don't understand everything about him, but I know that he has helped me and he helps me every day. I couldn't have done it without him. And Paul here says the same thing. You, you need to be confident in what's gone on in your life. Confident in who Jesus is and what he is doing and has done and is doing and will do. Confident because you are saved. It's the most important foundation for everything. Look at um, verse 3. For what I received, Paul is saying, I pass on to you as of first importance. This is the most important thing, the most important foundation of your life. 
And he goes on to explain why. He says, he explains the good news about the objective reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is the heart of the Christian faith. Look at verse 4. That, well, just halfway through verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Locating it in the scriptures. Saying this, is, this was predicted, it was prophesied, and it happened. That he was buried. He really did die. This is something, not just uh, an apparition or a, a kind of fake death or, you know, he died in spirit. No, he died. He was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This, again, was prophesied centuries before it happened. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12, the 12 disciples. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What Paul is saying is that this gospel is something which is founded on reality. Jesus really did die. It was predicted and he died. And the reason we, we know that he died for our sins is because he was raised again. That was the, 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 the proof that what he said before was true. People don't rise from the dead. But Jesus rose from the dead because God raised him. He really is the real deal. He is the one who can save us. And Paul is saying here, if you don't hold on to this firmly, verse 2, everything's in vain. If you don't have a confidence in, in what you believe, actually you're wasting your time. More than that, actually, you ought to be pitied, he says elsewhere. You know, you've given yourself to this life, but it's not actually making any difference to you. I don't know if you've been following some of these stories about confidence in the Christian faith this week. So Biddeford Town Council, did you read about where prayers have been banned from the council of Ferrara? That's um, kind of stirred up, very interesting um, uh, set of events. Baroness Wasi on Tuesday, a, a, a Muslim peer, um, she was speaking uh, to the Pope, actually, and she said this, that Britain was under threat from a rising tide of militant secularism, secularization. And writing in the Telegraph, she said that um, religion was being sidelined, marginalized, and downgraded in the public sphere. And uh, when she was speaking to the Pope, she urged Europe to become more confident and more comfortable in its Christianity. This is a Muslim peer saying this. Europe, get more confident and comfortable in your, your own Christianity. On Wednesday, um, the Queen, who's just an amazing woman, amazing Christian woman, she said in a speech at Lambeth Palace where there are a whole range of um, people from different faiths who'd gathered together. And the Queen put the church front and centre in this speech to them. And um, she said, this is important in the life of the nation for the established church to take its place. She said, the established church was occasionally misunderstood and commonly underappreciated. And particularly in re- relation to other faiths here in the UK, she said this, woven into the fabric of this country, the church has helped to build a better society, more and more in active cooperation for the common good with those of other faiths. She's saying, actually, the very reason we have freedom of religion in this country is because of the Christian faith. We can be confident in what we believe, and that allows us to say, you know, that we want freedom for you to discover that for yourself. And that means people are going to explore different faiths as well. We have freedom because of our Christian faith. The Queen is saying, be confident. Baroness Wasi, a Muslim, is saying, be confident in your faith. St. Paul is saying, be confident in the gospel. I think more than that, if we don't take our stand, if we don't speak up for what we believe and get confident in this, then actually the secularism that is around will take the ground that is not rightfully theirs. They will take it if we don't speak. If we're just silent and lie back, secularism will take over. And it's going to be for the detriment of our society and for our country. God has given us a vision to be confident in our faith. So how can we be confident? How can we, at St. Paul's Shadow, how can you and me, how can we grow in confidence? Well, three very simple things. One is to come to church. 
you know, some people make a habit of, you know, once a month, if I feel like I'm just feeling a bit you know, tired, I can't. Come to church. It's at church you'll be encouraged, you'll be strengthened, you'll be able to worship with others, and you'll be able to help others, um, you know, the people around you to, to worship God. It makes a difference. When you make a commitment, say, I'm going to worship, I'm going to come to church, I'm going to, I'm going to participate in this community, that will make a difference to, you, to your confidence. If you miss the morning, come in the evening. Don't miss a Sunday. Um, secondly, join a connect group. If you're not in one, this is the place where um, other people are going to disciple you. And actually, you can disciple other people. Jesus has given us a mandate to make disciples of all nations. All of us can be involved in this process. I can help um, my neighbor by encouraging them. Um, I was uh, uh, just telling the 930 service that I actually, for a short amount of time, I was a tutor. Um, where I was teaching um, someone Latin. They had to pass an exam when they were 13 years old. And I taught them Latin, which is amazing faith from the, parent, from the parents' point of view, because I hadn't really done very well in my Latin O level. So um, I was teaching this person anyway. But the thing I realized was that you just needed to be one chapter ahead. This guy passed his exam, so I earned my money. One chapter ahead. We just need to give what we've received to the person sitting next door to us. That's all they need is what we've received and actually as it's as we give we'll receive more we'll get excited about the impact of what we have um, discipled in our friends our neighbor our colleague whatever it is um, people in our connect groups and we'll grow more and more as we see that happening and it's not just the pastors in the church who do this actually we all need to take responsibility for one another we are the priesthood of all believers Thirdly in this is invest in your own relationship with God. Make a, make a daily habit of prayer and Bible reading. Check out these scriptures. Let them penetrate your soul and you will grow in confidence. Paul says, be confident. Second thing that we can grasp as well uh, from this message is that, uh, uh, Paul's desire to invite people to hear the Christian message. Invite people in. Look at verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you. Verse 1, I preached to you, and you received it, and you've taken this stand. The gospel is something which is transmitted. It is passed on from one to another. You know, when Paul here in verse 2 says, hold firmly to the word I preach to you, it doesn't mean hold on to it and don't tell anyone. It means hold on to it in your heart so you can be confident about it and give it away, pass it on. It's supposed to be given away. We are to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. That is what disciple making is all about. To communicate this to others. That's why... We've called this year Invite 2012 because we want to get good at inviting people to hear about Jesus. It's what this Contagious Christian series is about, um, being equipped to tell others the gospel. That's what's working out in these connect groups. You know, we find, we've um, been looking at connect groups at finding the style that suits us. You know, some of us are fantastic preachers and other people are really good at serving. Other people are just really good at, you know, just talking and conversation and so on. But in each way that we, God has made us and how we're formed, we need to speak about Jesus. We need to tell other people about Jesus. We, find, um, we, we, we need to look for opportunities to tell our own story of how Jesus has worked in our life. If we don't have a story, then today's the day to start that story. But also we need to help people to see the big story. The big story that we find our salvation in. We find our place in God's history. Do you want to hear the 10 seconds? I tried it in five seconds. It doesn't work in five seconds. 10 second gospel. You want to hear it? 10 seconds. God made us for a relationship. We blew it. Jesus has come to sort that out. You can receive him. Do you think you could do that? back of an envelope thing isn't it that's the big story of course you can embellish this it goes deep this story but it's as simple as a a child can understand it 
the most important thing for us is we need to receive it. That's something, that's something for others as well. They need to receive this. They need to actually do something about it. We need to be involved in helping people to discover Jesus for themselves. So I want to encourage us to invite people to meet Jesus. Invite 2012 starts with you and me saying, can I introduce you to someone who's changed my life? I want to invite you to meet him. That it might be the way that happens might be an invitation to church or to Alpha or to the Connect group. Or if you're doing something like, you know, just um, uh, the gardening, you might be helping out with the food bank vegetable patch, the shad patch. And you can say, well, why don't you come you know, to a friend, come help with me. Come to do something together. And people experience God's love. Because what we want is people to encounter what we kind of call up, in and out. Up, they, we want people to experience a relationship with God. His love for them. In, we want people to experience the life and love of our community. Out, we want people to experience the love as a neighbor of ours. Pass the gospel on. Pass it on. We need to pray. We need to pray that God will help us to do that. We need to pray for our friends who might be in a position to hear that. So be confident. Invite people in. And thirdly, play your part. Look at verse 10. Paul says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. He's been... He doesn't deserve to be called an apostle. He's been persecuting the church. I am what I am. And his grace was to me um, without, his grace to me was not without effect. Now I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And his work as an apostle was to spread the good news. He was someone who took a lead in that and, and equipped and encouraged other people to do that all around the world. He, um, the known world, let's say, he planted churches. And he's clear about why he did it. It's not because of anything he'd done, but it was what God had done with him. God's grace was at work in his life. God's grace, it is God's initiative. I always think about grace as um, just splitting up G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. We have everything that God has for us through what Jesus has done on the cross for us. God's riches at Christ's expense. And he pours out lavishly upon us everything that we have. Relationship with God, healing, transformation, purpose in life, hope for the future. That's something that's at work in you as well. God's grace is at work in you. And it's our, our role and responsibility is to say, yes, Lord, do it more in my life. More of your grace. More of your spirit in my life. Work through me. Touch people around me. So what is, just as this is Paul's response, to work hard as a result of God's grace in his life, what is our response? How can we work hard um, in response to what God has done for us? Well, I think there are three simple things that every one of us can do. Everyone praying. Everyone serving. Everyone giving. First of all, everyone praying. We're encouraging people to pray for 10 people. 10 people you know who aren't Christians. 10 people who are friends or family or colleagues or neighbors and pray that God will touch their lives. God will speak to them. God will um, reveal himself to them. Pray for opportunities to share your faith with them. Pray for opportunities to invite them to something that, where they might respond in some way. Tell them your own story. Tell them the big story about what Jesus has done for them and forgiving them and giving them new life and giving them a hope for the future. Make that list and begin to pray every day for these people and just see what happens. I think that's what we do, isn't it? Lord, hear the people. Please do something with them. And then let's just watch. And we can tell stories about what happens over this next year. Pray as well for St. Paul's. Pray for this church. Pray for the glory of God to be revealed in this church. Pray that you experience that glory. That's what we need and that's what we want. That's what we need to pray for. Everyone praying. When, when we pray, I think as Wesley said, coincidences happen. When we don't, they don't. 
pray. Everyone praying. Secondly, everyone serving. We want to encourage you to join a connect group. Serve the person next door to you by helping disciple them. Encourage them. Help them. And, you know, push them towards a stronger faith. But also join a team. Do you want to just um, lean forwards to your seat front? And there will be a green card. Have you seen that? Join a team. If you're sitting in the front row, it's behind you. But um, grab one of those. We'd love to encourage you to join a team. If you're not in a team, join a team. If you're in a team, recruit other people into your team. And the thing about being in a team is that it's great fun to serve with other people. It just makes a difference when, you know, we could get the, we could pay people to do the refreshments. We could pay, actually, but it's not going to be the same. Or we could get one person, could take do a rotor, and it's just one person at a time does everything, and they get tired, and they have 364 days to rest. Actually, we could do that, but we don't. We get people together to, um, to be a team because it's more fun doing it together, and we can disciple each other and encourage each other by doing that. And there's lots of things in there on Sundays, um, welcoming and hospitality, worship and um, technical um, stuff. We've now got a, a camera, so you could be on the, um, the tech team for that. Um, set-ups and clear-ups um, and the children and youth teams. Lots of things on Sundays, but also midweek, debt advice, night shelter, food bank, um, the gardening, the shad patch, um, it's community football, it's children's clubs, community organizing with telco. Lots and lots of ways you can make an impact in the life of the church and in the life of this community. So... Um, If you want to find out more, you're not committing yourself to joining one, but if you want to find out more, take this box, um, and we'll be dropping these into a a box later on in in this service. Um, Everyone serving. Thirdly, everyone giving. Today, we want to give people an opportunity to give to this vision, to give financially to the work of the church. Um, Today, I'm not going to talk, I have done before, I'm not going to talk about regular... um, uh, financial giving. That's part of our discipleship. That's something which we uh, are called and encouraged to do is, is weekly to set aside or monthly, if it's easy with standing orders, um, to set aside uh, the first fruits of, uh, of the money that we received and give that to the Lord's work. If you want to uh, find out more about that, then just on the give thing, tick um, I want to start a regular standing order. We're trying to, I think, a third of the church give by standing order. We'd love to make that two-thirds of the church. Um, giving even a small amount regularly will make a huge difference. That's for another time. We can go into a lot more teaching and detail about that. And if you want to find out more, look at one of my um, talks online where I've talked about that in the past. Today I want to focus on one-off gifts because we've got an opportunity to invest in Invite 2012. Um, we, you p- heard prayers earlier about raising 50,000, actually 54,000. And um, we want to give uh, to um, grow capacity in this church. So one of the things we've started doing is just um, sadly for the mums and the other people who like sitting on the sofas, in this service, we've taken the sofas away because we want to actually increase the capacity downstairs, but also we want to increase the capacity upstairs because we believe that actually if God's going to grow the church, we need to make that available. And if you've ever been upstairs during a worship service, it's quiet and you feel detached. And so we want to make, make, um, get sound and vision capability up there as well so that people feel, yes, I'm a part of it. I'm part of this growing community. So just um, here are some things to just um, look at. So... Um, uh, first of all, next slide. This is what the church looked like in 2005, January, when we first came. It was pretty dingy. Um, it was, the, the, the ceiling was peeling and falling down. There were various holes in the roof. There was lots and lots of damp. Uh, next slide. Is, um, this is what the church looked like. It was dark, um, dark pews. Um, it was only used for an hour a week. And it had that 1930s concert hall ceiling which was pretty disgusting. And um, do you see that grey colour just in between the ceiling and the walls? That was basically smog from uh, 40 years of being on the highway. So that's what we had, and you can see it now. This um, this is uh, about a year ago, this next picture. Um, Transformation, um, actually through lots of teams at work, and Nathan um, 
um, the old verge doing a lot of stuff as well. And we've even, you can see the sides of the galleries have been painted. There's a kind of a work of developing this space. But we want to put, uh, enable the, you can see the seats in the, in the galleries there. We want people to be able to start using that space. And so we need to invest in that space. That's going to cost money. Next slide. Um, how many people have been involved in refreshments here? Hospitality and refreshments? Okay, you're going to love this. We want to develop the hospitality room, the refreshment room on the left-hand side as you come into church. We're going to stop getting water from the toilet because <laughs> that's the only water supply in the church. And we'll enjoy a coffee. Um, uh, we don't get it from the bowl, don't worry. We get it from a tap. <laughs> And we're going to develop the refreshment room. This is more difficult than it sounds because it's a grade two star listed building. You need to get various permissions and you need to go through lots of channels and, and difficulties and so on. But we'll have a sink in there. We'll have a taps in there. We'll have the opportunity to store things that we can't at the moment. So that's the refreshment room. We need to invest in that space. That will improve hospitality in the life of the church. Next slide is um, developing the loos. We have one loo in this church. And in the end, in five years, I think the five-year plan is to get um, access from inside the building downstairs so that we can develop downstairs and develop the loos and have a proper kitchen downstairs. That's, that's five years down the line. At the moment, you have to go out of the doors, go around the church, down some steps, through some other doors and in. Um, so we can't do that at the moment. So we want to develop loos, perhaps a disabled loo. We could do that in addition to the existing one, or we could have three loos there. But... Anything is better than one loo at the moment. So that's what we'd like to do as well. Simple, but um, makes an impact in the, the, uh, the life of the experience of worship, shall we say, <laughs> if you're rather desperate to do something about it. So um, just some simple things here. And here's a list of um, what, the, this, what we're raising money for um, in, uh, with this gift day. Um, so far, we've raised £9,000 before the start of the day. Um, the earlier service, we've been um, asking for people to um, give to this. And I, I want to encourage you to treat it like a wedding list. You might say, oh, well, I'd like to give to that. And um, can I buy a speaker, please, as part of the sound system? Or can I buy um, uh, a web page um, <laughs> or some design work? Or I want to buy the sign that's going to be on the front of the church or whatever. There are lots and lots of possibilities. But be creative and, and say... This is, this is my part. This is the part I want to play in giving to this vision. And these are all ways in which we can help develop a place where it's easy and good to invite people to come in. That's what it's all about. Um, just so you know, roughly 50,000 people, 250 adults, 50,000 pounds, 250 adults. If you divide that up, that's about 200 pounds per person. Some people can give one pound. Some people can give 10,000 pounds. But it's, you know, it's the average of when it all rocks out is about £200 each. And so um, if everyone gave 200 we'd be there. Simple as that. So coming back to this message. Paul says, be confident. The Queen and Baroness say it as well. But Paul says it. The Word of God says it. And we must be confident. Confident in the gospel. Because it is the gospel that changes people's lives. Jesus Christ can change your life and he can change other people that you know's lives. Be confident. Secondly, off the back of that confidence, invite people in. We want to see people's lives change. We want to see this church grow. We'd love to see it double in size. We'd love to see the galleries beginning to be used and, and start filling up. We'd love to see people coming. And that will be through each one of us playing our part, inviting people in. And thirdly, we want to play our part. We want everyone praying. We want everyone serving. We want everyone giving. And together, the people of God doing that will make a huge impact. Not just on St. Paul's Shadwell. It's going to make an impact on Shadwell and on East London and the nation. Would you like to stand?